So good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Matrix Online Seminar. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have Professor Avi Wigneson from the Institute of Advanced uh, Study in Princeton uh, to present a talk. Um, so a little bit about Avi, he uh, studied computer science uh, and received a PhD in 1983 uh, at Princeton, spent a few years in California and then uh, moved back to Israel and became a uh, faculty at the Hebrew University in 1986. Uh, then he joined the uh, IAS as a faculty in 1999 uh, and moved there full time in 2003. So Avi is very well known for his contributions to uh, computer science and, and mathematics, particularly discrete mathematics. And one of the things he's known for are so-called zero knowledge proofs where you can validate uh, uh, in, theorems and, and information without exchanging information. So it's, it's, a, it's a way to um, validate online um, bank transfers, for example, without exchanging information. So Avi has received many awards and prizes throughout his career. Most notably uh, was the 2021 Arbo Prize, one of the biggest prizes in mathematics, uh, for uh, together with uh, with a collaborator and for his foundational contributions to theoretical computer science and discrete mathematics and their leading role in shaping these fields uh, of modern mathematics. Today, Arvi will talk uh, about a recent uh, uh, result, the value of errors and proofs, a fascinating journey from Turing's seminal 1936 R0 equal RE to the 2020 breakthrough of MIT star equals RE. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the talk. Um, we'll reserve question time for after the talk. Please submit your questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll get through the questions at the end of the talk. Avi, over to you. Okay, let me show my screen here. All right, uh, thanks for inviting me. I uh, am going to tell you about the uh, value of errors in proofs, and there is a subtitle that I'll explain. Uh, it's uh, more of a story about the evolution of the notion of proof within uh, computational complexity theory, which is my uh, area. And uh, I'm going to conclude with this breakthrough that uh, I'm not part of, but I want to, that's one when it came out. It really compelled me to, uh, you know, to prepare a talk of this uh, nature about, uh, uh, you know, how this uh, study uh, of different notions of proofs and proof system arrived to this uh, amazing result. And I'll explain it. Uh, you know, that just a precursor to the result. I'll explain the notions throughout. Um, and uh, let me start. The plan of the proof is the. It's simple, I want to tell you about the value uh, of errors in proofs and uh, modeling them. And uh, I will not talk much, but it's huge to talk about the influence on my science and technology. I'll talk more about the conceptual uh, uh, contributions, about paradoxical properties that uh, proof systems can have and uh, relations to mathematics, eventually getting to this uh, recent breakthrough, but to talk about errors in proofs, I'll have to talk first about errors in computations. And to talk about these, I have to talk first about proofs and computations uh, without errors. So I'll introduce all of these. Um, but uh, the real message is uh, you'll see the evolution of uh, various notions and they all uh, follow naturally in the com complexity theory methodology of uh, of modeling uh, various constraints of insisting on algorithmic efficiency on classifying problems and so on for those who want to read more about this material or basically almost anything you want to know about computational complexity especially if you are not uh, experts already then you can look at my book which is free online um, so I want to start with proofs and computation. Uh, it's a long story, and I'll just give you two points in this long, very long history. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, long ago, Euclid, in his book, The Elements, uh, describes 
plane geometry, and actually you can view it in two ways. You can view it as a, a proof system in which you can prove uh, basically all theorems uh, to in place plane geometry deducible simply from five axioms. So it's a proof system and uh, these are theorems, but at the same time, you can view them if you look at them. I mean, all the proofs are actually constructive and uh, all constructions use just a straight edge and compass. So actually they are computations. And in this setting, uh, plane geometry, the two are equivalent, proofs and computation. That's not always the case. Uh, jumping ahead to the turn of the 20th century, you probably all know about uh, Hilbert's dream. He believed that truth in mathematics is the same as probability and that everything provable is automatically computable. Proofs can be found automatically. And uh, this dream was shattered, as well known, the first by Gödel in his uh, incompleteness theorem, proving uh, you know, the first equation, the red one is wrong. And then by Turing, uh, showing that the second one is wrong. And I want to talk about Turing's, uh, Turing's work, that's what's relevant here, uh, because uh, first of all, um, in his famous paper, uh, he introduced uh, Turing machines and used them as a formal model for algorithms. And that was, a, of course, the birth of the computing revolution. Uh, people started implementing this, but I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, I want to talk about this theoretical part, this theorem above. So for this, we have to understand what algorithms compute, and I'll talk just about decision problems. So any set S here uh, can be a set of numbers, can be a set of sequences, can be a set of uh, functions. Uh, and you should think of a set as a collection of problems. I give you an element and I ask you whether it's in the set or not, okay? Uh, so it's a you know, set or property. You may want to compute whether X is in S. You may want to prove to someone that X is in S. That's the nature of the problems algorithm solve. And uh, he considered two uh, families of sets. R is a class of uh, sets that are computable by finite algorithms, algorithms which always hold. And RE, recursively innumerable, innumerable sets, those provable to finite algorithms. So in other words, those that which can be verified by finite algorithms. And his main theorem was that these two sets are different. Here in this general setting, uh, proofs and computations are different. What we are going to do in this talk, I mean, of course, he did it using the particular set that was in, in one, but not in the other, the famous halting problem. We are going to, uh, what complexity theory in fact does in general, move to quantifying uh, complexity uh, constraints on algorithms. So instead of finite algorithms, we'll look at efficient algorithms, algorithms which uh, can be, we will finish computing in our lifetime, efficient algorithms. And the analogous sets here are the famous P and NP. P is a set of, uh, uh, decision problems computable by efficient algorithms, and NP similarly sets provable to efficient algorithms. And in this talk, I'll just use efficient as a synonym. Uh, of you know, complex question, whether P equals NP or not, whether proofs and computations are the same in the efficient regime, this is a big open problem of computer science. We don't know, or I know of mathematics. We don't know, uh, and we'll come to that. Uh, I want to just uh, talk about proofs and proof systems and just start with just lots, lots of examples. Uh, basically, what you should have in mind, what do you think of is a convincing argument. I mean, for mathematicians, very natural, but also for laymen, it's very natural. And uh, we said our claims are that an element X is in S, let's say a number is a prime or something. And there are two uh, players in this game, uh, verifier, which you can think of as a referee, someone who's eager to know, but maybe uh, doesn't know how to prove it himself. And uh, a prover who is, you know, going to help the verifier by 
giving him an argument for supporting this claim. But of course, while this guy may be uh, infinitely clever and can prove anything, uh, he cannot be trusted. So these pictures are from Baba's story about Arthur and Merlin, and this is, uh, you know, sort of this story stuck for prover and verify. So let's see some examples. Uh, here's a set, the set of composite numbers. It's a subset of the integers. I can give you, uh, you know, a number like the one in the claim and say, that, you know, it's this composite. Uh, there is simple argument for such a claim. I give you uh, two smaller numbers and the claim that their product is the input. And verification is simple. You just multiply these numbers and see whether you get the original. And that's what the verifier does, either accept or rejects according to the simple computation. Uh, it's an efficient algorithm, uh, just arithmetic, multiplying numbers. Of course, it's general. Uh, it works for any uh, input, not just this particular one. And this proof system, that's a proof system. Um, it just specifies to the verifier what to do, how to check an argument. Uh, the set of theorems in this proof system are just a composite numbers. And I want to stress that we don't care about the complexity of finding an argument in proof systems, right? We just care. In fact, we, we believe that this is a hard problem. Cryptography is resting on the fact that factorization is a hard problem. So uh, that's not an issue. The important thing for proof systems is that ver verification is an efficient procedure. Here's another example, Sudoku. So here the set is a set of, you know, uh, uh, puzzles. Uh, the claim is, uh, you know, this, for example, this particular Sudoku puzzle is solvable. Uh, an argument is just, you know, filling the empty squares according to the, you know, the rules of Sudoku. So to check an argument, you, you know, it's very simple again. It's sort of uh, basically pattern matching. You just see that all rows and all columns and all square, little squares have different integers in them. And uh, again, in general, of course. And the set of theorems, you know, it may sound weird to you that I call them theorems, but it's this proof system, proofs, a uh, set of theorems, which are the solvable Sudoku puzzles. Uh, of course, in general, and in fact, uh, you know, this is not a finite problem. You have to really think about, you know, Sudoku puzzles, of uh, four by four, n by n, uh, there are infinitely many instances. And here's one that's maybe more familiar. Uh, you know, we talked about one deductive system, right? The system of uh, uh, plane geometry, another, you know, arithmetic one is piano arithmetic, for example. Here are the objects you uh, work with are uh, formulas over integers. Um, you start with a set of axioms and, uh, you know, very intuitive axioms. And then you have some deduction rules like this mon modus ponens here. And uh, what's an argument for a particular statement for a particular formula? Well, it's just a, a list of other formulas. And, you know, with the last one being the whatever claim we have. <clears throat> and the verification procedure, again, is simple and efficient. Uh, one checks that uh, each one of these statements, say one, a two, etc., is either an axiom or follows from previous statements by one of these deduction rules. And so again, that's uh, efficient and general. And here you can prove other types of theorems that uh, maybe look more familiar, like there are infinitely many primes or Fermat's last theorem and so, and so on. So we've seen many types of push systems uh, and there are many others. And I want to go to the essence because that's uh, you know what we like to do when we model. Uh, in, we want completeness, namely that true claims will have proofs. We want soundness. We want that false claims will not have proofs, and we want this uh, efficient verification. So you can distinguish efficiently convincing arguments from faulty arguments. And uh, again, efficient, I remind you, we we'll insist that this is a polynomial time in the length of the claim. The claim can include a, you know, a length bound, let's say, uh, you know, the journal does not take more than 500 pages of uh, papers. 
So here's the complexity uh, theoretic point of view uh, of Cook and Recha from 79. They just wanted to encapsulate all proof systems. We'll see what this gives. Well, a proof system is just an efficient algorithm. We call it a verifier. It has two inputs, a claim and an argument. And what should it satisfy? Um, the completeness uh, requirement. So if the claim is true, then some argument, some argument convinces the verifier to accept. Right? This is a happy case where uh, we call the claim a theorem and the argument a proof in mathematics. And sometimes, if the claim is false, uh, you know, the ver this verification procedure will reject every argument. That's what we want. Uh, and then, you know, every such system, every such verifier defines a set of theorems, those that can be proven, those claims that can be proved in this framework. And we have many such sets. And uh, the theorem uh, here is that. Uh, uh, of Cook and Rechow is that this captures this collection of sets is exactly the class NP, everything provable to efficient procedure. Uh, so we saw examples of composite numbers, the solvable Sudoku puzzles, and uh, you know various theorems in plane geometry or in uh, piano arithmetic, and it's a, a superset, maybe strict, maybe not, of P in which, uh, you know, the verifier simply ignores the argument, right? These are things you can compute by yourself. So again, we find from this point of view, the P versus NP problem here. Good. So now I want to start going to errors in proofs and in computations. And uh, the first, let me give you just uh, one slide on publicity computation. I'm sure most of you have seen this. Uh, the basic assumption is that uh, nature is very benevolent and gives us uh, access to uh, you know, unpredictable phenomena. So we assume we have such access, and of course, uh, why not use algorithm? Why not use randomness in algorithms? That's the uh, incentive. And uh, to contrast, uh, to define probabilistic algorithms, let me say first what a deterministic algorithm is, just to contrast. So A computes a function f if for every input uh, it outputs the right value, right? f of x, always. And in contrast, in a probabilistic algorithm, of course, the outcome is a random variable. And what we demand is that uh, uh, we call an algorithm, a probabilistic algorithm for function f, if most of the time it does it, right? So for every input x, uh, when you look over the random choices of the algorithm, it produces f of x, let's say, with two thirds probability. So error at most one third. And that's here we introduced errors in algorithms, and we are all familiar and uh, you know comfortable with that. Uh, I want to stress a couple of things about this uh, definition. First, that uh, it uh, doesn't matter what constant you pick there, bigger than half. So errors can be reduced arbitrarily in this model. If you don't like one third error, just uh, you know, run your algorithm k times with independent randomness and then take a majority vote. And then you can reduce the error exponentially and still be efficient. And uh, of course, what's the value of allowing errors in this context? It's obvious. I mean, it seems to be so, we seem to be able to solve many more problems than we can deterministically. Seem, I want to stress, we don't know that. And the rationale uh, for using, for allowing errors is that, uh, well, uh, we believe we have randomness and uh, anyway, we tolerate uncertainty in life, so why not in algorithms? Uh, that's a pragmatic uh, rationale. So that's uh, the concept we know and understand and uh, use. I'm sure many of you use uh, probabilistic algorithms uh, in various uh, contexts in mathematics. Um, now let's see how we import it to the context of proofs. And it's very natural because we define proofs by algorithms, by the verification algorithm, right? This definition, public proof systems, was uh, appeared in 85 in these two seminal papers. Uh, we take this algorithm, let's say efficient verifier, and make it probabilistic, very natural. And then we this demand that these two properties, uh, completeness and uh, soundness, happen not always, but with high probability. Again, it can be amplified to any degree. 
efficiently. So that's uh, that's the definition. And as before, so here we introduced errors in proofs. That was very convenient thinking of verification as algorithms. Uh, we can uh, again look at the set of theorems provable in this system. It's at least a superset of what can be proved in deterministic ones. And uh, we give it a name, uh, the class of sets that can be provable in this setting with two probabilistic verifiers. And I'll explain the next slide what I mean by interactive. You'll see that in these proof systems, not only is a verifier uh, probabilistic, but is allowed to interact with the prover. So let's see in picture what it means. Uh, in NP, as we said, the, you know, the claim is given and then the prover sends an argument to the verifier. It's like you solve a problem, prove the theorem, write a paper and send it to the journal. In IP, interactive proof, so here it was deterministic and uh, it was always correct. In IP, uh, we have randomness and uh, only demand high probability completion and uh, soundness. But above it, we allow not just uh, one directional uh, information from prover to verifier, but we actually allow a conversation in which uh, maybe the verifier can ask questions of the prover. It's a good question to ask about any model, whether it's a reasonable model. And uh, you know, I would say certainly it's reasonable because we use it all the time. We uh, use it in interaction, we use, we use it in the classroom, we allow students to ask questions. Um, and there are many settings where uh, the, the you know, informal settings where uh, the convincing, uh, uh, you know, trying to convince someone takes form interactively. Uh, the first message that's really important is that this notion, this extension of normal proof systems, deterministic ones to probabilistic interactive ones is a revolutionary scientific notion. You see hints of that in the, in this talk, uh, more than hints, but there's much, much more. It's absolutely revolutionary scientific knowledge, not just mathematical, not just computer science. Um, so it goes to uh, science and technology in general, but uh, I will uh, focus on showing you a couple of proof systems with paradoxical properties, particular zero knowledge proof systems and PCPs, probabilistically checkable proofs that uh, uh, I'll, I'll elaborate on, on what's written here in a second. Uh, but again, I want to talk more about the methodology and, uh, and in particular, how these two very different notions, in fact, the second evolved from the first and how it led to the quantum proof systems eventually that we uh, talked about. So that's the plan uh, you know, for the next 15 minutes and then we'll finish with the quantum ones. Um, the zero knowledge proof systems uh, that I mentioned are interactive proof systems, uh, just like you know I just defined, except that you add another demand which looks totally unreasonable. You demand that if the ver verifier accepts, like right, the case when it's a theorem, the verifier learns nothing about you know about anything. In particular, not what the proof the prover had in mind was. Just, you know, it allows the prover to convince the verifier uh, of the correctness of the claim, but nothing beyond that. So, first, I want to comment that it's not trivial to define, but we'll stay with the informal uh, sense because it's, you know, uh, captures essentially everything. And the main question, yeah, I'm sure if you have seen it, see it for the first time, you know. Uh, is anything, you know, is it possible to prove anything without giving any information? Uh, uh, can a convinced, convincing proof be uninformative? Uh, try to think how would you convince anybody that, uh, you know, the, about you know, factoring or if you prove the Riemann hypothesis, how would you convince anybody without you know, any information of this truth? It looks like it, you know, uh, you know, it's not clear that it can be used for any uh, proofs. Uh, but uh, actually, a year after the definition, we proved that, uh, in fact, it can always be done. Under the standard cryptographic assumptions that one-way functions exist, uh, everything in NP, everything provable, 
can be made into a zero knowledge proof. Again, if you have a, yeah, I'll maybe show a slide on this. Every proof can be made into a zero knowledge proof. So, yeah, I'm not going to show a slide. So, uh, just try to imagine, I'm not going to explain how, but try to imagine how would you convince anybody that the Riemann hypothesis that you just uh, you know, found the proof of the Riemann hypothesis without, without giving any hint of uh, uh, about the proof. So this can be done for the proof of the Riemann hypothesis for proof of any mathematical theorem. It has lots of impacts in theory, uh, in practice, and uh, beyond the digital world that I will not talk about. I want to mention how it created or how it motivated the creation of even more proof systems, the multiple uh, prover proof systems, MIP. So let me go back to this uh, theorem about zero knowledge. And remember that uh, we had a cryptographic assumption, we basically, be, you know, assume that we can encrypt messages for this, uh, you know, ab ability of uh, having zero knowledge proofs. And we ask ourselves in this, uh, um, we ask ourselves whether cryptography is essential. Is it necessary for the proof? Maybe you can do zero knowledge proofs without cryptography. And the answer is actually yes and no. I mean, I put with Ostrovsky that it's an absolutely necessary in this context of IP. But on the other hand, uh, you can change the model as we do. Uh, and it's not always necessary. So here is a model that we'll uh, spend time on, the multi-prover interactive proofs, MIP. I'll focus mainly on two prover uh, interactive proofs. We, we define these in the, this paper in a, 89. And uh, what's the difference from IP? Well, you have just have two provers uh, who are interested in convincing the verifier uh, of the truth of this claim. The verifier doesn't trust either. They can collaborate as much as they want before the interaction starts. Then, you know, uh, verifier puts them in separate locations and, uh, you know, interrogates them separately. So it's the same thing at the end of this conversation, the verifier decides to accept and reject and has to be correct with high probability as before. Uh, in this new setting where you have more than one prover, we prove that you can actually have zero knowledge proofs without any assumptions. In fact, uh, in this setting, the physical separation between the provers replaces the computational assumption. And the result we, which we were really set out to get this uh, you know cryptography independent kind of uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, very much satisfied us and uh, that's roughly where I left this uh, uh, exciting area just uh, of multi prover interactive proofs where it just uh, was ready to blow up and take off so let me tell you about that uh, before, I mean, you can ask whether this model is reasonable. I can only tell you that uh, when we had this paper, all this paper, the institutions we were at insisted on, on patenting it. So, uh, but it's it's just uh, important for many reasons, and we'll see. Uh, when we introduced this, so uh, and we saw IP, so we had basically a hierarchy of proof systems. MP, IP contains it. MIP contains that. Uh, the, you know, ethos of the field demands that we understand what is the power of these proof systems, what kind of sets, what the complexity of sets they can prove. And there are trivial inclusions that were known from the start that IP is in P-space, polynomial space, that uh, MIP is in non-deterministic exponential time, but this looked very, you know, generous. Uh, everybody believes that all of these are very close to MP, actually. Uh, we had a few non-trivial examples, and then, you know, it was stuck for a couple of years until there was a, an explosion, basically, of results and complete characterizations of these classes. Uh, here they are. You may not like uh, the acronyms of uh, complexity theories as much as I do, but that's okay. I, uh, these all have conceptual meanings that uh, let me not read out. Uh, um, the one I want to focus on 
yeah, maybe I should stress that uh, there is no cryptography in the theorem. So I just want to stress that we understand the power of uh, IP of uh, two IP, and NP. Of course, we don't know whether it equals P or not. But from these results uh, in this last work here, the understanding became that with a randomized verifier you can verify long proofs without really looking at them. So let me, uh, hardly looking at them. So let me uh, define this in a couple of minutes, this uh, notion of PCP, publicly checkable proofs. Um, that they are non-interactive. They go back to the NP model. So here's the, you know, uh, what's the PCP. It's like uh, in NP, the prover just sends an argument to the verifier, like submits a paper to a journal. And the verifier is now publicistic and is allowed to read only 20 bits of the argument. So, you know, that's all the verifier is allowed and still has to get uh, the answer correctly with high probability. Again, looks uh, to any mathematician, this looks ridiculous. I mean, how could you find a bug in a hundred page uh, proof. I mean, there's a picture here of potentially, uh, you know, maybe Andrew Wiles is now working on proving the Riemann hypothesis. And uh, when he's done, there's a you know, mountain of books, uh, a thousand pages, which contain an argument. What do you do uh, if you can only flip a, a page and look at a few, you know, sentences there or a few bits there? It looks ridiculous that you'll find a bug, but the theorem I just mentioned is that this is the same as NP. So in other words, every proof, every proof, no matter how long, can be converted to another proof, not much longer. And it has the property that it can be verified by, with high probability by looking at 20 random bits. So referring, you know, <laughs> if this was practical, referring would be great, easy, trivial. We'll be happy to be referred. But of course, the real uh, value of this is in uh, theoretical applications, in optimization, coding theory, complexity theory that I will not go into. Uh, and it has uh, some part of it were made efficient enough to be implemented in uh, um, cryptographic system. Okay, so let's. Uh, sort of summarize this part of publicistic interactive proofs that we have complete understanding of the, their power, both of the single prover case and the two prover case. And the last part of the talk is going to move away from publicistic uh, proofs and proof systems to quantum proofs and proof systems. Again, I have to give you, uh, you know, basically a one page introduction to quantum computing. Maybe you've seen it less than publicistic ones. Uh, first the computation and then the proofs. Again, uh, same motivation. Nature seems to, uh, you know, the quantum mechanics seems to work and we seem to have quantum phenomena available and the same logic uh, says, uh, you know, why don't we use it in algorithms? Let's build computers that uh, manipulate quantum superpositions with unitary operations, uh, unlike the classical computers. So that's a suggestion. Even formalizing it took, took a couple of decades, but it is formal, just like P and NP and BPP. Uh, we have now BQP, the, the class of uh, problems uh, solvable by efficient quantum algorithms. And uh, yeah, and we have a model and we start studying it. It's at least as strong as publicistic ones. Uh, and uh, people found the various uh, stylistic examples until this uh, really um, uh, earthquake where Shaw published a paper showing that two particular problems can be solved efficiently by quantum computers. These are factoring and discrete log. Of course, these are not arbitrary problems. These are the problems underlying essentially most cryptographic security systems we have, digital ones. So uh, that sent uh, you know uh, you know the world into a frenzy attempt to develop many things, to develop 
just at supporting technology to build quantum computers and billions were invested both by companies and uh, and uh, governments and of course as you know that we are not there yet lots of attempts to develop post-quantum cryptography to invent other hardness assumptions besides this problem that maybe are not solvable by quantum computers new quantum algorithms which we don't have uh, many more yet uh like the question whether np can be solved by efficient quantum algorithms but uh, what i want to talk about is new models and these are new proof systems allowing quantum provers and verifiers so again the generalization is very simple we allow the verifier to be an efficient quantum algorithm the same you know it's so convenient when proof systems are defined by an algorithm you just change what kind of algorithm it is uh, what was, uh, was the first to define uh, this notion? So we'll have star to denote the same proof systems where we allow the provers verifiers to be quantum. In the one prover case, uh, IP star was defined, and it took about a decade to understand that it doesn't buy you, you know, having quantum there doesn't buy you more. You cannot uh, prove efficiently more sets than the sets provable by classic prob probabilistic interactive proofs. So IP star equal IP equal P space. The story with the many provers is different. It was defined in 2004 in this paper. So that's the analog of having two provers or many provers and it's quantum uh, allowed for all of them. Uh, the first result was to see that it's at least as uh, strong as a classical notion. Even this is not obvious because both provers and verifiers get more power. And then uh, a few years later, just a couple of years ago, uh, there was a real breakthrough in showing that it's much more uh, powerful. In fact, it's uh, you know much more powerful than the classical one. It can solve proof problems in non-deterministic doubly exponential time to efficient verifiers, which is something uh, we know MIP cannot do. And so the race was on to understand what's the full power of multiple prover in the interactive proofs with quantum abilities. And that's the breakthrough I want to mention. Uh, uh, MIP star equal RE. So you can actually take even uncomputable functions, RE, remember from Turing, these are like the halting problem, and convince uh, membership in uh, such a set to an efficient verifier. I'll explain a little more about this in the time I have left. Um, but that's uh, that's the breakthrough and that's uh, what I want to, to tell you about. Uh, mathematicians and physicists uh, immediately cared about this result because it's not just a you know, pipe dream of computer scientists who define various models, uh, uh, extending computation that doesn't really exist physically, like quantum computation, but the study of this model turned out to be absolutely fundamental. I mean, it was clear from lots of, you know, work on this. Uh, uh, many of the connections were understood even before. But let me tell you about some of the consequences of this complexity theoretic result. <clears throat> uh, it provided counterexamples to some uh, very well-known and long-studied conjectures. Uh, in quantum information theory to the Thielson problem, it resolved it in the negative. It uh, provided a counterexample to the well-known uh, Kahn's embedding conjecture in polynomial algebras, and in group theory to another conjecture that I will not, uh, well, I won't go into any of them <laughs> given the time. I can really explain only the first one. I uh, would admit, um, but uh, anyway, they you know uh, talk about quantum interactive proofs, but they uh, immediately apply to classical mathematical notions studied long before. And the key thing is really the start of this, uh, you know, the first paper defining MIP star, which already made lots of the connections uh, to the EPR uh, paper on quantum mechanics to Bell inequalities and the power of entanglement in quantum mechanics. And let me tell you in the last five minutes, uh, a few words about uh, these connections and what the physicists and what computer scientists did. So 
We study, as I said, models, and we look at lots of variations of models. In particular, one important variation of the uh, two proof interactive proof uh, uh, framework is uh, just allowing one round of interaction. So, what's, what does the one round of interaction look like? The verifier sends one query to the first prover, one query to the second prover, a random query and gets answers and then decides whether to accept or reject. So the verifier is a function. And so we can look at this function and what we are really asking ourselves to distinguish true from false claims is uh, what's the probability that they convince the verifier, right? That's how we distinguish them. Um, this gives rise to a view of uh, proof systems as games in which these provers are trying to maximize uh, overall strategies they have you know uh, they cannot talk to each other of course uh, after they got their queries but in advance they can collude in a strategy um, that they can con convince the verifier to accept so this function verifier of the questions and answers leads the verifier to accept so this is a value of a game it, de it deter is defined just by the verifier function and just by the distribution on the questions that are asked that's a game that's a classical setting. Uh, and in fact, in this relative classical setting, the value doesn't change even if these uh, provers are allowed to share some random string. They don't communicate, but they can share a random string. What's a quantum analog? The quantum analog to IP star, uh, it's exactly the same picture, only that now, instead of sharing a random string, they are quantum and they can share a quantum state. In other words, they can be entangled for those. I know it's not meaningful to some of you, but uh, I hope to many of you it is uh, meaningful. And uh, you can define the maximum success probability of convincing the verifier in this setting, when they share a quantum state. Uh, for us computer scientists uh, studying proof systems or what sets are provable in these proof systems is basically a question of what is the complexity of uh determining or approximating this value and value star of some games of this class of games and uh, you know basically this was done as i told you these characterizations were achieved that's a point of view of uh, computational complexity it turns out that physics defined these same models both long long ago here it is, uh, started actually at the institute where I work by Einstein and his postdocs, Podolsky and Rosen. Uh, if you squint your eyes uh, enough, you may see in this picture describing the famous uh, experiment they suggested, uh, you know, sending photons in opposite direction in the, you know, which run at the speed of light but are entangled. Uh, and then having, uh, you know, the two measurements on the two sides, think of them as provers. Uh, anyway, there's a formal sense to it. It's very similar. And uh, they just call them different names. This was called the classical or local game. This was, and this uh, random string is uh, what may be called, uh, what they call theory of um, hidden variables for explaining uh, the ability of uh, this, uh, photons to be correlated. This was called a quantum non-local game, and uh, here it was Einstein worried about this spooky action at a distance, uh, you know, because uh, it seems to defeat the speed of light barrier. Uh, and they mainly looked for examples of games in which uh, there's more power in the quantum setting. This would, uh, that's what Einstein hoped to achieve with this uh, experiment, and in fact it was achieved. Um, they wanted to basically test whether quantum mechanics is complete or whether something additional is needed. And the sequence of work, some suggesting a very different game, but I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of the Bell inequalities. This was the first time where uh, a game was proposed and analyzed, so proving that the, the value star is bigger than value. And uh, so it can happen that quantum adds power in this sense to the convincing probability. And knowing that this led to actual experiments and experiments basically validated 
uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, you can test that uh, in in uh, in the lab, or actually, it's not a lab, but oh, over uh, some several uh, many miles, uh, you can verify the success of this experiment, uh, getting higher probability to uh, correlate these uh, photons. Anyway. Uh, the point of view here in physics was generating uh, different uh, games and finding these gaps. Where this paper introducing MIP star knew about that and referred to that and made a point like good complexity theories that uh, we should study all uh, non-local games like we study, you know, all the you know, all the um, languages in NP and. Uh, Given this, this allows this sequence of work leading to the breakthrough I mentioned, uh, uh, allow like in many other complexity classes, uh, NP and P space and IP and so on, to be able to have the flexibility of reductions and amplification and uh, completeness results and uh, using various other techniques developed in the classical setting, uh, coding theory and PCP, uh, which eventually led to this, uh, to this breakthrough. So the structural understanding, this uh, flexibility of uh, uh, having many different problems and uh, you know moving between them, uh, like we do with algorithms, as we use uh, algorithms, subroutines, and other uh, of others, and so on, uh, to prove that uh, MIP star contains uncomputable language languages, and also have these amazing implications to mathematics. So that's basically the end. Uh, let me wrap up with some uh, summary of what we've seen. Uh, we've seen many types of uh, proof systems. We've seen the value of errors in proofs, right? We saw how adding randomness uh, and interaction and allowing error in proofs uh, to have proof systems which have really magical properties. And this, we know that classical proof systems cannot have them, like uh, zero knowledge or PCP. Uh, another important point I want to make is that many of these uh, advances uh, were theoretical, starting from Turing, and uh, sometimes completely unfounded in uh, practical uh, either uh, you know demand or knowledge. They drove uh, practice and uh, you know both uh, uh, practical systems uh, that we use and also you know. Uh, various uh, uh, consequences in uh, science and uh, society. Um, again, I stress this several times. I believe that uh, this uh, power of complexity theoretical methodology that uh, drove the development of these uh, models, the insistence or the study of the algorithm, algorithmic efficiency, uh, notions of classifications, reductions, and completeness were essential to the whole development. And it's really cool uh, how many, many different uh, uh, disciplines, in this case from physics and math, but in many other results I didn't talk about of complexity theory, you, you get other connections. So uh, it's really cool how the algorithmic point of view uh, connects different areas. Okay, thanks again. Here's the, the, my, uh, again, my book recommendation. It's free on my uh, website. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Avi, for a wonderful talk. So let me applaud on behalf of uh, everyone here. Um, as we said at the beginning of the talk, you can submit questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, there are a few questions in chat. Avi, uh, uh, yeah, so people I can, can't read. I can read them to the uh, audience. So a question by uh, Igor. Uh, how much do we know about separation between these classes? Uh, if I understood correctly from the drawing, graph isomorphism separates uh, NP and IP. Uh, what about MIP and MIP star? Okay, so good. First of all, graph isomorphism does not separate uh, uh, NP and IP. As I said, IP equals P space, and we don't know that uh, P space is uh, strictly larger than NP. It's an open question. It's another open question, like P versus NP. So we just don't know that. I mean, it looks it, we believe it, but we don't know that. On the other hand, we do know that MIP and MIP star is, are different because MIP 
is the same as non-deterministic exponential time. Any you know finite algorithms can do it, whereas MIP star contains uncomputable languages. This was the breakthrough, and so uh, they are different. Uh, another question from uh, Masood. Uh, could you please comment more about why you think considering various proving models are revolutionary in science and technology? For instance, <clears throat> what sorts of innovations do you foresee uh, will be possible by these models? So let me not foresee anything, but go by the past. Uh, the, uh, both notions of uh, interactive proofs uh, and uh, the various ones I've shown you, uh, uh, zero knowledge ones, uh, PCP ones, and others I didn't show you, uh, developed uh, uh, practical systems, for example, for delegation of computation that's now routinely used for cloud computing. Uh, are part of our essential part of a variety of uh, cryptographic systems uh, and cryptographic protocols, including the, you know, the hot, uh, you know, blockchain technology and the uh, digital currencies that. Uh, are there. Uh, the scientific uh, impacts, uh, you know, you see, and uh, some are mathematical, and, you, and uh, in physics, you see, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I can talk about, I can talk about it at uh, as great length. There are, there are plenty of examples where uh, uh, these models have already impacted the, both science and society a great deal. There are, uh, you know, important consequences to optimization that I mentioned uh, briefly. There are amazing consequences to coding theory in the development of new codes uh, that again are used in, uh, in uh, systems and I, I can go on and on. So I don't, uh, you know, without predicting, uh, yeah, it will continue. Um, a question by uh, Usha. Um, Oh, okay. So just uh, thanks for my uh, you know, free online book. So let me continue. Thank you for being interested. A question by Sardar. Um, what stops the PCP theorem from being applied to magically detect that the received code word actually is actually correct by sampling few bits? Maybe the code word is, would be too long. Well, First of all, it's a very good analogy between uh, PCPs and, and codes. And in fact, uh, some of the uh, you know, uh, infrastructure of proving the PCP theorem comes from coding theory. Uh, it's the same uh, intuitively. Uh, PCP is verifying a proof by looking at a few bits of it. Uh, after encoding it appropriately, it's similar to detecting that uh, um, code word send after corruption is uh, you know is uh, an honest code word or or not by sampling a few bits. These are called uh, locally testable codes, locally decodable codes, and uh, yeah, this analogy is perfect. Only that proofs have uh, some semantic meaning, right? We want to know about correctness, whereas in in uh, in codes it's only syntactic. So that's the difficulty a bit, you know, in moving to PCPs. Uh, Dilip, um, how, sorry, how is the zero knowledge proof of a statement like there are infinitely pr uh, many primes look like? Well, they will all look the same. Uh, I didn't say much about the proof of the zero knowledge uh, theorem, uh, but I'll tell you how it starts and why it doesn't matter what the theorem uh, you want to talk about is uh, because it goes into a machine actually this machine is called MP completeness, which converts any mathematical statement into a very uh, particular type of statement. So in our proof, uh, the statements are statements of the form a map can be three colorable. Right? So you probably heard of the four color theorem, every plane map can be colored by four colors, but not every plane map can be colored by three colors. Um, and so, you know, this question of whether a map can, has three coloring or not is a, you know, a good computational question, but it's also NP-complete. What does it mean? It means that you can take an arbitrary mathematical theorem and convert it by an algorithm known to everybody, to you also, I mean, a simple computer program will translate the statement of the claim, okay? Let's say that there are infinitely many primes uh, 
and uh, you know you should provide the proof in 100 pages it will translate this into a map okay so the map will not be much larger and moreover the claim is true if and only if the map is three calibers so you have just reduced the problem of proving infinite uh, uh, primes to the problem of you know coloring a particular map now the farther uh you know amazing property of this translation is that it will translate any uh proof of the uh infinite uh, number of primes to a three color into a legal three coloring of the map if it's true right so it will if you as a prover have a proof a mathematical proof then the same algorithm that translates the claim to a map will translate your proof into a coloring and so the only thing we have to do at the end of this story is be able to prove in zero knowledge that uh, maps are three calibers. And how to do this, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, it's uh, for another talk, but it does use cryptography, as I mentioned. All right, uh, a question by Alexander. Uh, which one of the two inclusions, uh, MAP star equal RE, is easier than the other one. Uh, uh, the inclusion in RE is, uh, is uh, yeah, it's pretty easy. Yeah, so the hard thing is to prove that there are languages that are uncomputable that can be, you know, not they are. I mean, every language in RE has a quantum proof with uh, many provers. This is extremely difficult. Uh, even the you know, this paper itself uh, by G and the collaborators uh, is 100 or 150 paper, pages, but uh, it relies on a mountain of previous results, uh, many structural results. Uh, if you want me to say one word about it, and uh, maybe it will hint to the connection to the Tillerson problem and to Brown's uh, uh, embedding conjecture. Uh, what happens when you have a quantum proof of with two provers or many or many provers is you know the essence is their decision is how to answer the questions asked by the verifier now they share an entanglement they share an entangled state they are in some hilbert space and uh, what they are allowed to do is given the question they are allowed to make quantum measurements that's the only thing they can do they do some quantum measurements and uh, using the results they answer the verifier so uh, you need to devise a way uh, for, you know, embedding uh, such uncomputable languages. Forget uncomputable. I mean, it's mind-boggling that you can do doubly exponential time, but uh, uh, even un un uncomputable languages into a framework where, uh, you know, such two... ...but space can, uh, can provide a convincing argument to a verifier with just polynomial time in the length of the of the statement, which is classical. So that's uh, that's pretty amazing. That's the hard direction. The other direction, I mean, people believed and they couldn't prove it that uh, uh, you know you can always simulate uh, MIP star by some finite algorithm. But of course, this uh, theorem shows that it's wrong. And maybe to say why do you need to go as high as uncomputable? I mean, what is the parameter? that uh, can go arbitrarily high. Those of you who know, uh, you know, why the halting problem is, uh, is uncomputable, it's basically, you know, I give you an algorithm, how do you know that it will terminate? Uh, that's a question. Uh, if you don't have any time bound on it, uh, you, you can uh, wait forever, right? Uh, what's the analog uh, parameter in, uh, in a game, in a quantum game? I mean, it seems like a finite description. The thing that can go arbitrarily high is the size of the Hilbert space, the dimension of the Hilbert space that the uh, provers will use. So again, there's uh, there's no a priori bound. People thought that there should be, but there isn't any. And that's a sort of, if you want, a, a hint of why they can be so powerful. But as I said, it's really complicated. Uh, I mean. Uh, what would be the impact of the breakthrough uh, MIP star equal RE to the post-quantum cryptography? Uh, I don't see any 
direct impact. Uh, although, you know, who knows, maybe some of the techniques uh, will, will have an impact rather than the result itself. Uh, the game in post-quantum cryptography is the, to find um, assumptions, to find computational problems uh, that you believe on the one hand, like factoring, you believe they are difficult to the entities playing, uh, you know, all these games to all the uh, actors on the internet. Uh, that they should be uh, difficult, but on the other hand, they should be they should have some, uh, you know, secret uh, doorway, like in factoring. If you generated the the number yourself, uh, some way to encrypt. So. Uh, yeah, we know such assumptions. There are a few that uh, many ones based on uh, the difficulty of uh, computing short vectors in lattices that uh, right now there's no quantum algorithm for, but, uh, you know, nobody knows. Of course, I have to remind everybody that it's possible that uh, um, there are classical algorithms to all these problems, not just quantum. We just don't know. Uh, anonymous, okay. I just read your resume and thrilled that I could hear you. I could listen to this wonderful lecture just because <laughs> the convenience of the pandemic. I agree. I was asked before, uh, uh, you know, we, we talked before the, the lecture uh, with Jan and uh, other people that will organize it. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, Zoom, this uh, pandemic, uh, allowed much more, well, it caused lots of trouble, obviously, but it allowed uh, much more interconnectivity between uh, different parts and, uh, of the world and mathematicians in uh, lots of different countries. And I'm happy to be in Australia, even though it's only Monday here in Berkeley. Um, Clement, hi. Has a class of problems decided by a protocol with one quantum prover and multiple classical ones? Uh, been proven. Uh, is it interesting? Does it reduce to uh, QIP, MIP, or something strictly in between? So, uh, as I said, we have a classification uh, of uh, protocols with one quantum prover. This is the same as P space, right? And multiple, cla uh, quant uh, multi multiple classical ones is MIP, which is equal to non-deterministic exponential time. So it's two, you know, classical cl complexity classes, P space and non-deterministic exponential time. And of course, we don't know whether they are equal or not. They could be equal, right? We don't, we just don't know that. Uh, yeah. More questions. Okay. So thanks, Avi. Yeah, I just have a question uh, myself. So when, when you include things like multiple provers, um, do physical constraint come into play? Like people might need to communicate and then there is the speed of light and, and, and other. So do these enter into considerations of proof systems? Okay, so the mathematical model doesn't need it. It just postulates that... Uh, after uh, you know uh, the provers discuss their strategies, they are separated. So uh, you know formally, their responses depend only on the question they ask, and you know whatever random bits they share or uh, quantum entanglement they share. But they cannot see the questions to the other. That's uh, easy to define mathematically, and uh, it's defined well. Also in physics, you define these things in you know, special relativity. You define. Uh, um, um, how, the, how is it called? No signaling strategies and so on. Anyway, mathematical definition is easy to give. The question is if you want to implement it. So I mentioned that uh, when we came up with this model, uh, our universities, which uh, were, uh, you know, these four authors, uh, uh, Kilian uh, Goldwasser, Benoit, and myself, were at Hebrew University and MIT. And they really wanted uh, to patent it. And uh, we couldn't see practical applications uh, at the time. They, I mean, you could imagine some, and that's what they, I guess, uh, uh, got them to invest money in it. And the application was, uh, you don't want to, I mean, it's great not to have cryptographic assumptions. It's complete security. What you need to do is, let's say you have a cash machine in which there are two slits for two cards. So your two cards are the two provers that prove that you are you. You are allowed to withdraw money from your account. 
And somehow, if you want to use this and this uh, model, you have to guarantee that there is some physical barrier, maybe a lead curtain between the, the two, uh, you know, places you put the cards in. So whenever you need to implement any of these uh, uh, ideas, results, you need to, uh, of course, worry about uh, <laughs> various, uh, you know, you know, physical, practical matters, and you probably know very well that cryptographic systems are being broken again and again. Banks are broken into the Pentagon; it's broken into the voting system in America; is broken into. It's not by. It's not that these guys can factor integers. It's not. It's all by uh, you know various implementation uh, you know details that they bypass in this way or another. That's uh, yeah. That's how they are broken. There's one more question here uh, again by Igor. Hi, Igor. Um, there, uh, uh, sorry, are there any analogous analogs of NP complete problems in these classes, uh, IP or MIP? Yes, so it's very unclear given the definition of proof systems that they will have any complete problems. But given the results which characterize them as space and non-deterministic exponential time respectively, they immediately inherit the complete problems of this cluster. So suddenly they do. Okay, thanks very much, Avi. Uh, we went through all the questions. So if uh, we'll give it one more minute if, if people want to post a, a last minute question. Uh, if not, I just want to thank you again for a wonderful uh, talk. I know it's uh, it's uh, well. It, I guess it's not late in the evening, but it's evening no. uh, where you are. Um, don't forget, next month there'll be another Matrix Online seminar, um, and we'll uh, notify you of that soon. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks again, Avi, and uh, yep. wishing you a good rest of the Monday. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending. Bye, everyone. Bye.